All right. Uh, our next session is a panel discussion. So join us with the uh, panel discussion, The Future of Immersive Technology, Navigating the World of XR. So getting us through the, this voyage, let's welcome our panel moderator, uh, Ms. Joanne Tay from Inco Infocom Medium uh, Development Authority, and our panelist, Michelle Ku from Deloitte, Torrance Liu from Soro IO, and Benjamin Chen from SIMRT Corporation. Welcome. Wow. Hi, everybody. It's really, really bright. I don't think I can see any face at all. <laughs> Okay, maybe that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, so um, uh, really warm welcome to everybody. Um, glad to see uh, a nice turnout today. Um, maybe just um, I introduce myself. I'm Joanne. I'm from IMDA, Singapore's Infocom Media and Development Authority. Um, and uh, this is an agency, it's a government agency, where we develop both the technology, tech, as well as our media industry. Um, I'm from the innovation team, and uh, we actually manage an innovation hub uh, at, located at uh, One North, uh, where we have specialized uh, labs, like uh, ARBR labs, our, uh, prototyping labs, and UI UX, UI, UI UX labs as well. Yeah, so... I think uh, this is a super interesting topic today. Um, before I hand the time over to, to my uh, panelists to briefly introduce themselves, maybe just uh, pull your attention to the business opportunities out here, right? So we do have early estimates that uh, suggest that uh, the metaverse is a million, no, sorry, trillion, trillion dollar opportunity for Asia in the coming decades. Of course, uh, later on, I'll let Michelle expand a little bit more, but she has done a very, very interesting piece of research, yeah, that actually talks a bit more specifically about the market sizes as well as the areas which we should be looking at. And I think uh, one of the key la layers of the metaverse, augmented as well as virtual reality technologies, have been had, had actually significant inroads into various industries, right? Um, of course, starting with games and entertainment, and uh, also slowly actually creating real social and economic impacts for businesses. Let's kind of like zoom in a little bit later into the L&D space. Um, locally, I mean, really about uh, when we talk about metaverses, when we talk about, uh, when we actually talk about classrooms, right? Our neighbors in Hong Kong, as well as Guangzhou, for example, they have actually created these, these, uh, these spaces. And uh, of course, not, uh, not to be left out, uh, Singapore has also done uh, early inroads there. Our friends at SUSS have uh, done that, working with uh, Hyperlab on that. So anyway, uh, <laughs> but I guess beyond um, the education sector as well as the healthcare sector, um, I think today we, we have together, right, uh, a very strong panel that uh, we can actually look into um, real life training training of workers, simulation of scenarios that are really difficult to replicate in real life. So today, with this topic, yeah, um, the future of immersive experiences, navigating the world of XR, we have a diverse representation from the ecosystem. Uh, we have Michelle Ku, director of uh, Deloitte Center of the Age. Yeah, want to give a wave? <laughs> yeah, and uh, we have Benjamin. Yeah, Benjamin of Learning Technologies, SMRT. Yes, hey Ben. And of course, uh, Terence. Terence uh, from so.io. That, um, yeah, yay. <laughs> so collectively, I think we'll really help to unpack this, uh, this, this challenge. So I'll start with Michelle. Michelle, maybe later on you can um, just start with this question, right? What are some of the useful insights you think would be good for innovators to hold on to when navigating this uh, journey in the XR space? Okay, insights for XR innovators. I think um, 
One very important thing to think about is how do you make your experiences human-centric? Uh, and I think the earlier speaker, right, he identified the user experience as sort of the number one important thing to think about. And really it's about thinking, how do you be human in a digital world? Uh, and I think that's going to be central to how people accept those experiences as well. So maybe I give an example. Um, I was giving feedback on a particular metaverse experience, and I noticed that all the female avatars walked in a very manly way. And I just pointed that out to the developers, and they said, well, no, but none of us actually noticed because all the developers were male. So I think it's important to have an inclusive group of people that you um, test these experiences with. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's super interesting. So really, although we are, are looking into a digital world, but really still focus on the human at the center. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Lovely. Um, yeah, so um, maybe I'll... Um, any, I'm not sure whether you want to share any pointers maybe from your research uh, which, you, which you studied uh, with, with regards to market opportunities in the metaverse. Well, definitely, I think we are quite optimistic about uh, this sector. Um, I think if you take a step back and think about what is the future of the internet, you can sum it up with three eyes. Right? The future of the internet is going to be more immersive, more instantaneous, and more intelligent. So the immersive angle, of course, is with the development of XR technologies, you're going to be able to have more three-dimensional experiences, experiences that uh, can connect the virtual and the physical worlds much more closely. And then it's going to be more instantaneous, you know, powered by 5G, Wi-Fi 6E, and other connectivity infrastructure. And then, of course, it's going to be more intelligent, powered by AI. And so XR technology, you can think of it as the window into this future of the internet, just the same way that PCs and smartphones uh, were there in the past. And so I think you would really see XR experiences slowly but surely um, becoming incorporated into our daily lives. And I think adoption, it's not going to be a big bang, but you know, it, it's going to be part of our lives and probably in a way that we don't even consciously realize that we're taking it up. Lovely. Thanks. Thanks, Michelle, for your, for your insights. Also another eye there. <laughs> So um, I'll invite uh, Terence. Yeah, Terence is an old friend of uh, Pixel. Yep. Yeah, he's been with uh, I think uh, we we we've been uh, neighbors for quite a number of years. <laughs> so so I think he's also he's also been long in this journey. So perhaps uh, Terence, you could uh, share some of the challenges that uh, you have faced uh, in your journey when actually creating XR solutions for companies that you have worked with. Yeah, and also share maybe how you have um, overcome them. Okay, well, um, I, I think this, this panel's discussion, uh, I was just thinking about it uh, as I walked in. It's a nice segue from the previous presentation. Uh, everything that was on the board literally kind of hits all the points. Um, so uh, as far as XR adoption today, uh, some some challenges you, you probably heard earlier, user experience, cost, um, you know, the, the shebang. Uh, anything that that is you know, some sort of shift in technology usage uh, is that's going to be all these friction points, right? So, um, so nothing that was mentioned earlier is anything unique uh, that that we face. We we, we see the same things. Um, I, I think I think with and uh, I don't mean to give too much away about my age, but uh, <laughs> I think for 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 a generation that's very used to um, cell phones, uh, I use always use cell phones as the benchmark. Right. I, I didn't grow up with it, uh, once again. Uh, it took a while for me, I was just talking to Benjamin earlier, it took a while for me to even get through, um, and most of you probably don't know this, but there used to be a device called a Blackberry. Um, and it's got keys on it, right? And I, I, I was on it for the longest time, and then iPhones came around with these touch pads and swiping, and I'm like, that's just dumb. I'm not gonna do this. Um, and I was hanging on to my Blackberry for dear life until my wife had to like wrench it out of my dead cold hand and say, no, you got to use this and this is the, the modern way and whatnot. And I'm kind of using this kind of retrospect to say maybe this is kind of where we are today. 
uh, the, the user experience is still new to a lot of people. Uh, there's cultural, there's demographical differences, obviously. Um, and from an industry point of view, even industry, we're, we're talking about cross-generational uh, workers in industries, right? Uh, prior to this, I was in the aerospace industry. I used to manage a team uh, as young as 21 years old to someone two years from retiring. And you can imagine just trying to deploy technology across that, that, that spectrum. Uh, that's always a challenge. Um, so so you know, there, are, there are ways to go around it. Obviously, you know, uh, having, you know, no, you, when, when you're in an industry, there is the uh, opportunity where there's a management mandate that you have to adopt. Uh, that's not organic. Uh, sometimes there might have resistance and pushback. Uh, then there are ways we as developers try to work around, you know, try that novel ideas. Uh, they're all specific to the kind of user experience you have to deal with. But one of the things that I think I'm actually quite bullish about going forward is obviously, and you guys probably would suspect, is with AI. I think with AI, not necessarily just AI in the experience side of things, but helping with manufacturing of devices, of solutions um, that could help solve some of these user experience uh, issues uh, in adoption. So, so for me, you know, it's all these friction points. Uh, you know, it's, you know, it's price, it's user experience. What was it? There were like about 250 items on that list. Um, uh, we, I, I'm hoping that's where all the players in the ecosystem can come together and kind of just tackle them as we go along. It's going to take a while. There's some stratification. Uh, I'm sure it's not going to be hom homogeneously addressed, but I think you know, edging away at it is really the way that it'll probably get the broader adoption that we all hope it, it, it will get to. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, thanks, Terence, for, for sharing. Uh, <laughs> I know I understand that you have worked actually quite closely with Benjamin. Yeah over the last uh, three, four years or so, yeah? So um, maybe, yeah, so maybe Benjamin, I'll pose a question to you, yeah? Um, so understand that you've been actually working very closely with uh, SIT as well as, you know, Terence, right? On a training program for train captains. Yeah, for, for, you know, for I think those in the room, not everyone's very familiar with, uh, with, with the transport system. Uh, do share a little bit more. How does it actually involve the deployment of the mixed uh, reality? And also share more about the project that you have uh, worked with, uh, with Terence on. Right. So before I go into the details, how many guys actually took the train today to this conference? I can't really see though, but uh, you know, there's quite a Three number of hands. you, right? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> right. But nonetheless, right, Guess how many trains do we run in the north, south, east, west line? So the line that we have, you know, I mean, if you take the one at Expo, right? There are two lines, right? But the one, the one that's serving the green line, right? Which basically, I like to just ask, how, do, how many think, how many trains do you think are running on that line? Any guess? Can you shout out a number? Yeah, any guess? How many trains do we run on those lines? Do you think? Models of trains? Hundred trains? Not the physical number, you know. I mean, I mean, not the physical number of trains, but the model types. Five. Five. You're close. It's about seven. Seven train uh, models that run on that line today. So, if you look in the avi aviation industry, one pilot, it's, uh, you know, trained for one type of aircraft, typically, right? So, our train captains actually uh, have to know how to operate seven types of train, train models. Right, and you have hundreds of them every year, right? I mean, we have to go through currency training. We have to certify that they are, you know, current, you know, and they do know how to respond to certain defects, right, on the, on the train. And basically for, you know, in terms of the line that you are, you know, that's on the green line, and also of all, you know, on an average basis, it takes about, the train actually revolves around the equator 35 times before it encounters a delay of five minutes. And that's the standard that we set for ourselves today, right? And to coming with this landscape that is a high standard to meet, as well as the fact that you know we have to ensure uh, the competency standards and the currency of our drivers, we need to you know have more innovative solutions to train them, right, on all the different uh, defects of the trains, as well as how to operate them rightly. So that's the impetus, right, on why you know we actually look for. Uh, innovative solutions. So if you read in the news, or you might have heard of it, the London Underground is actually moving towards that direction. So typically, the railway industry is a very traditional industry that we train hands-on, right? And at the most, we do full-scale simulators, right? 
But now, you know, as we you know, have it over the last few years, when it comes to the expansion of the real network, as well as having to create a steady workforce to you know, uh, be competent in a short period of time, we need to look for innovative solutions to equip uh, in terms of vocational training uh, for our drivers, for the current as well as the new drivers, you know, they have to, uh, they have to when it comes to time, time to market, we have to reduce that as much as possible. So hence that project with Terence, where you know, we need to, we are actually expediting the training as well as to cover you know, a more comprehensive suite of uh, defects, train operation skills in a short period of time. And the way we, we went about it was actually, well, an uh, idea by SIT, right? who came to us to talk about, you know, we're actually changing trains on the main lines, right? And we're decommissioning some of these uh, trains, you know, the older ones. And they came to us to, to, you know, from the angle where, hey, look at all these, you know, decommissioned trains, right? We can actually use them for training. You know, you talk about building large-scale simulators. You have all these trains that you're going to, you know, um, you know, discard. And you can actually make use of them, right? So hence that project whereby we, look, we explore XR to train our train drivers in these uh, defects, right? And there's some defects when it comes to training 600 people a year, it's not possible, right? You know, even with full-scale simulators, we have a limited number of them. We don't have the luxury of, you know, uh, using the trains all the time. And definitely we can't uh, simulate some defects on the train, an uh, air compressor fault, you can't exactly damage the compressor for that. So therefore, you know, we actually use XR to simulate some of these faults. Yeah. Using the decom the, some equipment from the decommissioned trains, as well as you know, having it to be you know, uh, overlaid with these fault indicators that uh, do appear right, when the train defects happen. Right? And, these, and we found that it works for us. Right, to that level of skill or level of the competency that's required for currency training, as well as to even allow the new trainees to experience you know, self-directed learning mode as well. So we thought that you know, when it comes to this, it does alleviate some of the pains that we have to um, maintain the high standard of uh, competency for that large number of growth stuff, for that number of trains that we run on the lines. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, lovely. Yeah, but. I mean, I'm also curious, right? Uh, how did you actually manage to... I mean, earlier on you mentioned that it's a traditional uh, industry, right? How did you actually manage to introduce XR into, yeah, into your company? So, you know, I was watching, you know, Oppenheimer, that movie, right? Yeah, that was a great movie. You guys, you guys should watch, uh, you know, catch it. You guys haven't watched, uh, catched it yet, right? So there's a very famous quote, or rather a quote in the movie that really struck me. It was the dialogue between Niels Bohr to uh, Robert Oppenheimer about algebra, right? Algebra, it's like sheets of music, right? But the point is not about reading it, it's about hearing it, right? Being able to hear it. And the part about this is about, you know, when it comes to XR, not many people can perceive it rightly, right? And they may just look at the tech and, hmm, okay, how does this, you know, really add value to, you know, the organization? They can't exactly see how to utilize it. And that was, those were the growing pains, you know, when it comes to convincing even upper management, even down to the vocational guy who's uh, driving the train, right? And, and for your information, we also uh, deploy VR uh, training for our station operation staff for when it comes to lift rescue training, right? Because we do have seven types of, you know, SMRT has a, you know, somehow of affinity with the number seven. We have seven types of lifts inside the system as well. How do we ensure the competency of, you know, uh, our op stuff to actually troubleshoot some of the faults with these seven types of lifts, right? So those were, you know, um, the part about it is that when it comes to being able to sing that song, right, find the right group of people to do it with you, right? And you have to target the, the people who are willing, who are willing to see or rather to see the, 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 the key issue that we're facing over here, and then to you know, bring them on board and to sing that song with you, right? And you start small. You don't go with a big bang. You start small and, then you, and you know, just you know, slowly, accumulatively, right? And of course, um, we also have the support of our IHLs, our Institutes of Higher Learning, where wherever we have an idea or you know, um, you know, that we want to test it out, they do um, help us, support us when it comes to advising what's, the, what's out there in the space and we can do a, you know, a project, perhaps even, even a living lab kind of arrangement that we can test some of these concepts out and validate that, right? So therefore, it was a journey. It's a journey to sing the song and to allow uh, people to hear it. And people eventually, the staff in the company eventually heard it, right? And they started to, and the, I think the thing is that, the, one of the most encouraging things is that 
they started to run it on themselves. They, they started to ask you for, you know, hey, how many sets can we buy, you know, the kind of thing. And, and how, many, how many more can we deploy on the ground? So, yeah, that's essentially part of the journey. Thanks. Thanks, yeah. Ben. I mean, you made it uh, sound like um, it was, it was um, I mean, it's a beautiful story, right? And, uh, but I'm sure there's a lot of blood, sweat, tears maybe behind it. A lot of talking. Huh? A lot of what? A lot of convincing. A lot, a of, lot talking, of convincing. Yeah. <laughs> and demonstrations as well. I see. Which Did Terrence was part of. Like, which Terrence was part <laughs> of. Yeah. 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 So always <laughs> bring in a friend, <laughs> an ally. <laughs> Did you have to also build a case, a business case? Did you have to, you know, pull up some data, etc., to, you know, to convince them? Yeah. Just like you know, I, I just did you know, briefly at the start, right? But what we have, you know, paint the context, then paint the ROI in terms of you know how is this training or rather this solution going to help us, right? To have a more comprehensive solution to you know um, equip our people, right? You can't put a price tag to some of the you know the inconveniences that you guys face, right? When you have a delay of five minutes, when it comes to you know our our train captains not being able to execute some certain procedures correctly, so therefore, you know, that itself, you know, painting the right context, the right amount of data, right? Like, like you know, what you've painted just now. Uh, and also the right, the right group of people, yeah. yeah, to sing that song with you. Yeah. Yeah. Michelle, on your end, you, you work a lot with business leaders. Uh, are this, you know, uh, whatever uh, Taren, uh, sorry, Ben has uh, shared earlier on, are they also similar with some of the business leaders that you have uh, interacted with? Yeah, so I think um, right now, so Metaverse was a hype term, right, in 2020, last year, 2022. Uh, and that has sort of died down already, uh, which maybe ends up as a good thing. Uh, we still see strong interest, actually, from business leaders wanting to know uh, how these technologies can be deployed. And at least now their focus is not just on chasing hype trends, uh, but actually really thinking like uh, Benjamin has done on what exactly is the, the use case and the application where it does return some kind of ROI. So I think amongst business leaders, um, a lot of their focus now is on how these technologies can help them achieve efficiencies. So looking at the current process and seeing how it can be done better and differently, more productively, more efficiently, um, with better outcomes. I think what I'd really be excited to see is when business leaders are starting to think about how can this create new business value. So not just doing the same things differently, but how can you do different things. Um, and I think that's when it will really capture the imagination of the public uh, and, and get interest in, in this sector. I yeah. see. Oh, I, I, love, I love what you're saying. So really looking beyond efficiency, right, mm -hmm. to Im improve yield, or et cetera, uh, human potential, but uh, also looking into new revenue streams as well. Exactly. New revenue streams, new ways of interacting with your customers, clients, um, things that maybe you can't even imagine today. Yeah. Would you be able to um, open a little door there, share with us a little bit? Where, where do you think it would go? Um, so, I, I think a lot of these technologies, like you, you see with virtual humans, um, you see with Web3 and NFTs, uh, I think when you go beyond the superficial um, applications, but seeing how you can combine these technologies in new ways, I think that's where we can really start to see things that we can't even imagine today. Um, and, and, and I think how at the center we are trying to approach it is really how do we spark that inspiration? Uh, and it's about getting people that maybe would not normally be in the same room together, uh, organizations that are maybe from different sectors coming together to kind of try and play around with these technologies. And I think from there, perhaps you start to see um, new industries emerging. Thanks, thanks, Michelle. <laughs> maybe uh, I can ask uh, Terence, yeah? So, Terence. Yeah. 
you know, you've been working with uh, Ben for some time. Mm. So is he your... How many doors did you have to knock before he opened your door? Well, uh, just to be very clear, this project, uh, obviously, was uh, the, the, the end users uh, were the solution provider. The SIT, SIT was involved as well. Um, actually, it was SIT that came to us, uh, and I'm looking at them right now, I'm trying to understand, just a couple of years ago, uh, really trying to learn about the technology. I mean, this, this is, I, you know, I, I think earlier I was talking to somebody, says, as much as we uh, do solutions, a big part of my work actually is in the education side of it. You know, explain to people what the technology does, does not at the point, how it's going to evolve and things like that. And it's a lot of experimentation, and I'm still learning. Uh, that's why we're here. Um, but uh, maybe outside of band, maybe something more relevant like some of our other clients perhaps. Uh, it, the process is long drawn. I, I, I'll have to say, I'll say it right now. Uh, not, not because of, uh, uh, it's just the nature of where it is. Uh, you gotta remember, once again, this is a, a nascent technology. So, no, uh, no the, the usual uh, uh, modus operandi has always been, hey, we saw this on YouTube, Whales are jumping out of basketball courts, and uh, can is it true? Can I do this? Can I do that? And that's usually the starting point, and that's where we we start that journey. And so the front end is really heavy. It usually, there's a lot of education handholding, uh, a lot of uh, learning, not just about technology, but the business operations, the use case, and see what's really relevant or not. I, I think at this point, really, I mean, we're talking about metaverse. Yes, sure, it's, it's a little bit fur out there, but we've a lot of our work is focused on the value here and now. Um, what can open, you know, what Michelle's talking, uh, what efficiencies, what opportunities can open here and now with the current state of the technology. It's not perfect, we know, that's why we're here, you know, talking about user experience and cost and whatnot, but already in certain places, it's already extracting value. So, so yeah, so it is a long drawn process, um, very heavily stacked up front, and, and I think that's worthwhile because that, that makes the, the end product more likely to be successful. Thanks, thanks, Terence. Uh, I just want to maybe open to some questions uh, from the floor. Would there be anybody? Oh, yes. Um, yeah, could we pass a mic over to this gentleman? Uh, thank you for this uh, panel discussion. Uh, maybe a quick question to uh, Benjamin and Terence. Um, is it correct to say that XR-based uh, training is a complement and not a replacement to the actual hands-on uh, training for the train drivers? And uh, if yes, right, so I assume before XR-based uh, training came, come along, it's 100% hands-on training. So once uh, you adopted uh, XR-based training, so what's the ratio like? Excuse you know, me, what's the ratio? Yeah, so ratio between uh, hands-on training and XR-based training. Is it like 50-50? used to be 100-0 and then it become 50-50. Is it the right way to see it? Okay, um, let me answer that question. Well, basically, when it comes to adoption, like what you say, it's actually a complementary uh, form of training. It's to augment the current regime, right? But we do see, I mean, like we, we do a comparison as compared to, you know, doing things practically, right? What is possible? I can't exactly, some, some, some faults I can't exactly, in the context of trained faults, for example, I can't exactly damage a compressor, right? I don't have full, uh, many of these full-scale simulators to do it, right? So therefore, some of these uh, you know, training uh, interventions, I'm, able, I'm unable to replicate. And even if I were able to, uh, it is not um, exactly with that level of fidelity that we hope, right? And we thought that XR did bring that value you know, that, that level of fidelity that's you know, sufficient for us to be able to uh, execute those trainings, right? If you ask me about a percentage, I can't exactly give you a percentage in terms of that manner because there are some uh, you know, train, uh, you know, scenarios that we can't replicate already. So sum summatively, I would think that you know, in terms of uh, creating you know, that opportunity, that avenue for training, that's the, you know, probably the way to look at it, but I think, yeah. Essentially, that's how I perceive it. And I, I think it's more of a process, right? So rather than there's a 50% target and you hit it and you stop there forever, it's more of, you know, at the start, what are some of the things that are easier to do first? 
And as people get used to it, that's when you can introduce more and more different kinds of use cases and even maybe different kinds of uh, XR applications. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for the question. I um, just want to invite also, maybe we can take at least one more question. Anybody? Oh. Hello. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much. I think it's interesting talking about the future of immersive experiences. Training is definitely one of the almost obvious uh, use case of extended reality, you know, with practical, hands-on, and things like that. Um, what about, in, in, maybe you can comment on, you know, digital twins, how we interact with 3D data, collaborative extended reality, immersive experiences, um, and how we can use, you know, the full data-driven organization, but with XR-based human-machine interfaces. Uh, would that make any sense? Uh, is that a possibility in the future as well? Maybe I'll take that one because uh, some of this does apply, not necessarily to this project per se. Um, but no, you brought up a very good point. In fact, we, we do talk about it. Like, um, uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, uh, in my previous life, uh, I work in the aerospace business. Uh, so you, some of you flew here. Uh, a pilot, before they get on board, uh, they have to fly on a flight simulator. And those flight simulators are not cheap, obviously. They are literally an exact, I worked on it before, they're an exact replica of the airplane cabin. You know, every button, every circuitry, uh, they can simulate faults. Um, but it's expensive, uh, I mean, literally expensive. Some of them cost probably as much as an aircraft sometimes. Um, because it's safety critical, it's mission critical, so they do need the hands-on, they do need that. Now, when it comes to all these technologies talk, talking about, IoT, digital twin, you know, um, you know, gen AI, however you want to call it, uh, you know, 3D collaboration data, you know, whatever, all, I think all these are truly what makes, you know, we talk about XR here, but really it's this, you know, confluence of these different technology stacks that provide the solution. No, you know, we talk about XR, we're not really, really, you know, yes, that, that 3D overlay and interactions, that's fine, but behind that is driven by, you know, uh, cloud, right? Uh, no, edge computing, perhaps. You know, there's all these things that powers it uh, or enhances it. Uh, and I, I, I think you're right. Uh, in the future is exciting because of that. that. There's all these things that continues to enhance it um, and, and, and make that solution all the more potent. So that's... I think that's, that's where it's coming from uh, as, as people start to understand these technologies. They're just not looking at XR as that one thing. They're looking at what can technology broadly bring to the fold. XR could be one of the main components, but it is powered by everything else that's driving the force behind it. Um, so I, hope, I don't know if that helps answer the question, but that's, I, I think, where, where, where we see it heading going forward. Yeah, maybe I'll just add on uh, with an example. I think the best... Um, system I've seen uh, where you combine all these technologies together from your AI data architecture to 5G to uh, XR technologies. It's actually at the National University Health System. Uh, their surgeon is, their pioneering surgeon is coming up in two sessions. You make sure you <laughs> stay for that one. Um, but to me, it was really beautifully designed uh, in how they think about their data architecture, having different layers, a research layer, another layer where it interfaces with the uh, patient data so that doctors have these research data at their fingertips, um, and then connecting those to the other technologies. And XR becomes just one different screen, one different way of accessing all that data, and, and this, by thinking through that data architecture, they're able to power many, many innovations, um, and that's, uh, to me, it's the most impressive one, so you, he's seated over there, you can ask him about it later. Lovely, thanks, Michelle. Um, any, anybody else? Maybe we have time just for one more, if there is, one last one. Hi, I'm uh, David from Capability Group. Thank you so much for the great insights that you guys are sharing today. So um, my, my question is uh, revolving around the adoption of XR in general in, in, the, in the economy and the market today. So for every SMRT that, that we hear about, there's probably three, four, five, six, seven who's not really ready 
to embrace XR, if you know what I mean. So we still have leaders, you know, uh, conventional or otherwise, still very doggedly you know, uh, holding on to face-to-face -face learning or uh, things that's done by the, by the manual. No, no. So what needs, I guess, for everyone over there, or what's, what needs to happen? No, what, what sort of mindset shift? Does, is there anything left that needs to happen to instigate uh, a widespread adoption in, well, Singapore? Let's, let's not look beyond Singapore right now. In Singapore, what, what needs to happen for, for uh, XR to be embraced as a BAU way of doing things um, in Singapore? I can Go ahead. Okay. Um, so I think one point is to make sure the tail is not wagging the dog. And so sometimes if your company or organization is not set up to be data ready, then having the XR may then be trying to force you know, yourself there. Um, and you may not see as effective a result. Um, I think the other thing, uh, and I think Ben mentioned on starting small and starting with uh, champions, is you, you get a group of really passionate people and they're just going to lead the way and show how it's going to be done differently. And they're going to be so much more productive and effective than everybody else. And then the laggards just have no choice but to <laughs> try and figure out what the secret sauce is. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, so what you're describing is your typical bell curve, right? At a, at a macro level, I mean, I usually take X, um, MRXR into an organization and in a room of 10, you get that bell curve, the I'd rather die than touch this thing to the, oh my God, that's the most amazing thing. And then the rest of us, uh, we're gonna wait and see what happens next. Um, this is not atypical, um, but I, I, along those lines, it's about, um, I, I, uh, starting small is one thing. I think it's about success stories because it is driving success at some level, uh, not necessarily consumer AR, but even you know you, the earlier presentation talked about gaming and ed, ed, education in, in, in areas where it's proven to be successful. I think that needs to be evangelized. I think that, that helps people understand it's actually driving value. Now, this is not just another novelty. I think that's always been something we battle for the longest time that is novelty. Uh, I mean, how, how do you think I ended up having to type on a flat screen where we, I was totally happy with a keyboard? Um, maybe that's, that's, that's where we'll draw our lessons from. Yeah, I think a lot of it is, you know, for myself, it's a, lot, a lot of it is about awareness and education with respect to these success stories. Yeah, so recently when it comes to, you know, um, we do host visitors, right? When it comes to, you know, how we implement XR, you know, in our organization, and quite a few of them came, so in from the same industry, I mean, I wouldn't say same industry, but transportation as well. They actually came to look, how do we do it, right? How do you do it from a, you know, an ITM perspective, industry transformation perspective, when it comes to defining your skill sets, right? All the way down to, you know, how do we actually um, select the right delivery methods to go about it? So it's a lot of all these education, a lot of you know, sharing of these success stories, right? Especially with those people or those organizations that have embraced it, right? You need to actually you know, educate and allow them to see and you know, that has been actualized. And that speaks for itself pretty much. And that forces people to think, you know, there are all these problem statements that I have today. Business, uh, you know, what seems, can't seems to be circumvented today. Probably, you know, in another organization, with the solution they're embracing, whether it's XR or, you know, anything, right? Um, I can actually do this too in this manner, right? It does help. I think, you know, we need a lot of uh, education and awareness when it comes to, especially when, like, startups like Terrence, you know, when you go share with them, what is exactly the distinction between VR, XR, what, what do you mean by partial immersification, immersion as well as a full immersion? What are the benefits of them? Who have embraced them and what are the benefit, you know, the projected benefits and who has actualized them as well? So these are things that, you know, that can be uh, communicated and proliferated, I feel, that will help drive that up. Yeah. If I can just challenge this point on success cases a little bit. Um, so I think, especially in, in this part of the world, we're always looking for success cases. And then everyone's just sitting around waiting for success cases. And then they're not taking any action. What I really like to see is many more people in this region really innovating and just saying, I'm going to try it. Um, 
And, and I think what helps is also you don't try it alone, but find an ecosystem. Maybe they're not in your organization, but looking outside, you know, IMDA Pixel is a great ecosystem. Um, and, and just go for it, you know, rather than just sitting around and waiting for success cases. And I think that would really make innovation uh, in Asia, or make Asia a, a bright spot for innovation. Ah, well, well, well said. I mean, it's more like, um, you know, really getting all those, even those failure stories out there. There's so much to be learned from there. In fact, if you can learn uh, from other people's failures, right, you can leapfrog uh, your project uh, and how you start it. And so I'm kind of like hearing, it's a lot about uh, mindsets that I think uh, our esteemed panel here has shared today. You know, failing fast, um, having that change management, which uh, Ben has uh, spoken uh, at length about, you know, really talking people on the ground, people in the middle, uh, and, and top management. And it, it forms sub um, subsequently a virtuous cycle, a beautiful virtuous cycle. And of course, do, do tap into the ecosystems that are there, which I think Michelle kind of like touched on, right? Uh, so yes, I, I guess, uh, yes, do join uh, <laughs> IMD uh, Pixel Innovation Hub. Uh, we are such an ecosystem partner. We welcome, you know, basically everybody. Yeah, um, most importantly, if you want to try, right? If you are corporate, you just want to innovate, you want to match uh, with startups like, uh, like uh, Terence, right? Uh, for example, we have the connections, we have the networks. Do tap on us. Yeah, do tap on us. And of course, you know, if you just want to have a very, very small, small way to, to just test something out, you can always put it on our open innovation platform. It's a national, Singapore's national uh, platform where you can just post a challenge out there and tap on the 12,000 uh, network of uh, problem solvers out there who are able to respond at speed <laughs> and, and agility that you like. Yeah, so uh, maybe just before I kind of like uh, close the, the, the panel discussion, uh, one key takeaway from each of our panelists, starting from Michelle. Okay. Um, well, I think and immersive internet is inevitable, another eye. <laughs> Um, but a human-centric one is not. And I think we need to make sure that the technology we create serves humanity and not the other way around. Terence. Okay, well, I'm, I'm more pragmatic, I guess, perhaps. <laughs> uh, I, I just say, you know, for, for, we're all here in one part of the ecosystem or another. Uh, for, for us builders, is keep building, keep experimenting, be flexible. Yeah, I think for you know, big companies like ours, we have to constantly challenge ourselves to challenge the conventions of what is possible. And I think it's to embrace, you know, not only from success stories, but even from failures and you know, continue to innovate, continue to think beyond what is possible. I think that, you know, that, 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 that the spirit of challenging ourselves to think further, to look further out there, it's quite an imperative one. Yeah. Lovely. I think what we've all heard is having the courage, right? Courage to try and all that. And uh, I really want to thank um, uh, our panelists up here. And perhaps I can invite the audience to also join me to just put your hands together to give them a round of applause. Thank you.